Episode 7 rolls around and we get the first day of classes, though things do not go pleasantly for Team Ruby. We can see that Ruby is the only one really enthused about rearranging the room. Yang wants to be excited, but was out celebrating late into the night and is thus tired and hungover. Blake seems to be attempting enthusiasm, but is so unused to normal social interaction that she's anxious to be all that vocal about it. And Weiss is decidedly uninterested since she's normally used to having servants do all that sort of work for her. Ruby manages to cajole them into doing the work, since they needed to get it done anyway, and everyone gets to work. After they rearrange the room, with some minor squabbles popping up between what denotes personal space, and the fact that Ruby shears the curtain in two, the room is eventually finished just in time for them to realize they're late for class. We see a montage of some of the different classes that are attending for the semester. Hunter Regulation and Law, which Ruby and Yang both sleep through, Sparring and Team Building, which Ruby goofs off in, Grim Studies, which Ruby doodles in, and finally Dust Application. It's in this class that Weiss's patience with Ruby and her teammates is tested. Ruby tries to be funny, doing some sort of visual gag. I had the idea for using Dust Crystals to imitate Port, but I'm not too sure how that would fly. And for a brief moment, she manages to get Weiss to chuckle. It just so happens, though, that Weiss chuckling causes her to tip a vial of potent dust they were working with and ends up blowing up the whole dust lab with a concussive blast. Shocked, dirty, and with her ears still ringing, Weiss shakes, growls, and shouts Ruby's name. Ruby says, uh, oops, and we swipe to Osbin's office. The scene opens with them being reprimanded for their poor behavior and for blowing up the dust lab in only their first day. Ozpin, being rather wise and manipulative, notes that the intention of this somewhat randomized partner and team selection process was developed in order to force individual hunters to learn to work with and against their own faults, not only as combatants, but also as people. Learning to cooperate and work together is one of the greatest assets humanity has in the face of the Grim, and while hunting alone is typical procedure, working together with other hunters, civilians, and military personnel is frequent enough for cooperation and coordination to become a necessary asset in the hunter's toolset. As such, recognizing problem students when he sees them, he has decided to assign them some guidance, a team one year their senior to help them work out the kinks in their dynamics, who they'll meet the following day. In addition, they're assigned to some community service in order to account for the damages to the school. Weiss offers to pay, of course, but Osman chuckles and says that it's not a monetary issue he's concerned with, but rather an issue of attitude. As Ruby shuffles out the door, Ruby stays behind to ask his advice and he gives the same speech, or at least similar rendition of the I've made many mistakes speech in order to put her worries at bay. Episode 8 begins the next day, and the four discuss what happened over lunch, with Weiss raising issue with most members of the team, especially Ruby. Yang and Ruby defend themselves, of course, but even though Ruby sticks up for Yang and her lackadaisical nature, Yang is slow to defend Ruby, showing some apparent unease with her sister. Blake is quiet, except for a brief moment when she notices Velvet at another table being bullied by Cardin. She clenches her fist and snarls, but Weiss brings her back to the conversation, finally addressing her issues with Blake, which, compared to Ruby and Yang, are minor at worst. Blake shakes her head and leaves the table, ending the conversation. The next scene introduces us to their older siblings for the year, Team Coffee, with Coco making a very defined, aggressive entrance in the same vein as a drill sergeant. Coco praises them introducing herself and her team, keeping on the drill sergeant act the whole way through. She explains that they're here to kick all of them into shape and get them functioning like a proper unit, saying that Ozpin's giving her power to punish all of them if they don't listen. When Weiss tries to speak up, Coco makes her do push-ups. Fox leans in and whispers to Coco that he didn't quite think this is what Ozpin had in mind and that Ozpin didn't give them any power to punish Ruby. Coco finally relents, acknowledging to just be messing with Ruby from the get-go. She defers to Fox, who suggests that the eight of them split off into pairs in order for Coffee to get a feel for each person's individual issues. He explains that anything they want to talk about is privileged knowledge, and that the school will expel any member of Team Coffee that talks about anything discussed between sibling pairs. Ruby, of course, splits off with Coco, Weiss goes with Fox, Blake with Velvet, and Yang with Yatsuhashi. 
We cut to each conversation and get a different insight on each of the characters involved. Starting with Ruby and Coco, the two go to Coffee's dorm room where Coco uses fashion to frame Ruby's issues. Coco, though a bit dry, is good-natured and jokes with Ruby, which eases the mood. Coco directs the conversation to how Ruby is approaching being a leader for her team, to which Ruby responds that she was planning to take up a more firm leadership role whenever the group was on a mission. Coco chastises her, explaining that being a leader is a round-the-clock duty, no matter the circumstances. Wanting to have fun and be a good-natured goof is all well and good, but Ruby needs to keep in mind that she's constantly wearing the team leader hat, and thus any outfit she wears, a metaphor for Ruby's actions, needs to match that hat, no matter the circumstances. We then jump to Yang and Yatsuhashi who are at the gym. Yatsu meditates while Yang does push-ups and talks. Yang is far more open about her issues and is actually quite thankful to have someone to talk to about them. She expresses her unease with her sister, both as a teammate and as a leader. She's proud of Ruby, but also wants her sister to stop depending on her so much. She also admits that she needs Ruby to be strong because she's afraid that one day she'll leave Ruby all alone without anyone to back her up which gives us an early indication that Yang not only fears becoming like Raven, but also acknowledges that despite that fear, she may very well abandon Ruby. Yatsuhashi doesn't utter a peep during this, as Yang uses him mostly as a sounding board for her issues. It's only after touching on her own faults that he raises some questions, challenging Yang to question her behavior towards her sister and the rest of the team. People, not just a good leader, need someone they can rely on and keep them moving forward. By fearing some eventuality that may never occur, all she has done is set a self-fulfilling prophecy in place that is distancing her from her sister. Yang makes a remark about Blake being distant, and Yatsu says that partners need to trust each other as well, and that she and Blake will bond so long as she's there to support her partner when she needs it. Rice is a slightly different story than the others. She and Fox sit down at the bench with Fox trying to open a dialogue by way of asking what her problem is. Instead, Weiss reiterates a condensed version of her gripes with her teammates. Ruby is too stupid, Yang is too lazy, Blake is too quiet, and tops it off with how, if she were in charge, she'd have them all whipped into shape by now. Fox attempts to speak again, only for Weiss to cut him off, saying that he couldn't possibly understand since he wasn't a leader. The conversation ends with the both awkwardly sitting in silence. Blake and the Velvet are the last two shown in the episode. Velvet takes Blake through Beacon's gardens, tending to a few of the flowers as she goes. After some small chit-chat, Blake finally asks how Velvet does it, why she puts up with being bullied by Cardin when she's a year older. Velvet is somewhat embarrassed one of her juniors saw that, but explains that Cardin might be a bully, but that an eye for an eye would make the whole world blind. Hurting him would only make him more resentful of the Faunus, and as such, she's going to let him get his frustrations out on someone who can take it, while she tries to figure out a way to maybe befriend him so he'll stop bullying altogether. That doesn't mean she'll put herself in position to be bullied, but she knows her limits. Even if it's painful, she can deal with him. She'd much rather gain friends than enemies anyway, and just looks as Cardin as an extra challenge in that regard. At sunset, the groups converge again and go their separate ways, with Ruby leaving the courtyard. Coffee converses about the people they were paired off with in vague terms. Coco remarks that Ruby is young and inexperienced, but she picked up on what Coco said very quickly. Yatsu remarks that Yang equally has a good head on her shoulders, while Velvet was delighted with her conversation with Blake, even if Blake didn't open up at all. Fox, meanwhile, laments that he couldn't get a peep out of Weiss. Coco pats his shoulder, saying that with what she saw with Ruby, she has faith Weiss's shell will come off one day. Episode 9 begins with Team Ruby and Vale doing community service, with most of them complaining about how two weeks of punishment for one screw-up is too harsh and how relieved they are this is their last day of it. Velvet is there to oversee them as they clean after a normal festival, with many of them remarking that this much cleanup will be nothing compared to the cleanup needed after the Vital Festival coming up in a few months. Ruby is using her semblance to create an airstream that sucks all the trash into ready cans held by Yang and Blake, and Yang compliments her on using it so creatively. She also helps Blake out when she struggles to hold down her own can against the Windy Blasts. Out of all of Team Ruby, Weiss is the only one not doing any of the work. Finding clean garbage should be below her station. Ruby tries to chew her out for it, but falters in her confidence. Yang backs her up just a bit, noting that it would go quicker and easier if Weiss helped Blake hold her can so they didn't constantly have to readjust it after every one of Ruby's bursts. Velvet steps in and suggests that Weiss help some of the other workers down at the stands instead, since it'll be cleaner, and Weiss reluctantly complies since the whole team would get in trouble otherwise. A few of the workers are excited to work with the Schnee and openly call for her to join them, noting that they'd be better company than a critter like Velvet. 
Vel frowns at the epitaph, and Blake flinches angrily. Velvet shares a look with Blake, shaking her head that it isn't worth it. Yang asks what that was all about, and Blake is quiet for a moment before entrusting to Yang alone, as a half-truth, that she used to be a Faunus ally, and language like that riles her up. Yang notes the irony of being on a team with Weiss after hearing that, but otherwise sympathizes with Blake, earning a small appreciative smile. The remaining three members of Ruby get back to work, and in their next wave of trash, accidentally come across a person they gotten swept up in it. They pull the girl out who is revealed to be Penny. Introductions go as normal, and she explains that she was curious why the area was roped off, which is why she wandered into Ruby's path. There's a brief conversation with Penny when Weiss wanders back over, brushing herself off after some scaffolding collapsed. She snarls at the workers, calling them ruffians and klutzes worse than Ruby. She takes notice of Penny, and further introductions are made. Penny offers to help them clean and proves herself incredibly able, holding two bins by herself and doubling their cleaning efforts. However, in her enthusiasm to help, she accidentally covers Weiss in trash, angering the heiress and prompting Ruby to defend her new friend. Weiss, pissed, says she's done for the day and goes towards the heliport. Ruby apologizes for Weiss's rudeness, and Penny says it's okay before parting ways with the team. Velvet, seeing the progress the girls made, calls it a day for them and congratulates them on finishing their community service. However, as the four head back to the helipad, they come across another dust shop that was robbed. The Galactic girls listen in to the police, who theorize it was most likely the White Fang like the last two robberies they've had. The next episode begins with Team Ruby going to Spartan class, though Weiss apparently went ahead for some reason. The three talk, and Blake thanks Ruby for her pointers when it comes to tuning Gamble Shroud, and Yang thanks her for saving her ass on the first test in Grimm's studies, which goes a ways towards showing both that Ruby is improving a bit as a leader and as a friend. As they approach the class, we learn why Weiss went ahead, with the other three members accidentally eavesdropping on her and Glinda discussing the possibility of switching teams or having the leader be reassigned. While Weiss is adamant about getting a transfer, Glinda rebuffs her, defending Ospin's judgment on the decision, quoting that hundreds of huntsmen have graduated from Beacon, and that the only times transfers were ever necessary were if for some reason one of the teammates could not complete the year. This puts a bad taste in everyone's mouth going into the class, and none of it is helped when Glinda announces that it's time to spar partners. Weiss refuses, citing Ruby as unworthy of her talents. Ruby is taken aback. She knew that Weiss didn't think much of her as a leader, but as a fighter, Ruby has a definitive sense of pride in her skill, something she thought that Weiss had picked up on being partners. Glinda, uneasy about the tension, allows the fight, emphasizing the rules in an attempt to keep things from getting out of hand, which allows the audience to understand both more about the nitty-gritty of Aura and about the mechanics of combat matches in the universe. Could even have some witty dialogue here, like Weiss being like, I know the rules, Professor, and Glinda being like, Rules change when the stakes are personal, Miss Schnee. It is too bad, then, that the rules do not stay changed when all is said and done. Ruby and Weiss duel, and it's an exceptional fight, with both of them going all out on each other, beating each other to an absolute pulp, and it ends on a very, very close win for Weiss. However, Weiss doesn't see the win for the hair's breadth away she was from loss, and instead lords it over Ruby as a sign of Ruby's incompetence. All Ruby can do is growl as Yang and Blake pick her up and dust her off. As Weiss walks into the shadows of the arena, we have a smooth transition to Torchwick scrambling out of the shadows, clearly injured and carrying a briefcase much like the one from Episode 1. He's being chased by a hunter, one who has clearly injured him. Torchwick uses a good amount of guile and trickery to delay the Huntsman, injuring the man significantly but ultimately is cornered at which point the Huntsman strikes. But instead of dying, Torchwick shatters into glass. The Huntsman is then impaled from behind by a sharp blade, killing him. Off to the side is Torchwick, watching Neo pull her blade from the man's back and screw it into her parasol. She coughs, and Torchwick is at her side, guiding her towards a van, commenting that while he's grateful for the save, she really should stay in bed. He needs her alive and well to pull off the biggest heist yet. Thank you for watching Section 2 of Fixing Ruby, Part 3. I'd love to give a big shout out to all of my wonderful patrons who have each helped this channel grow into what it is today. If you want to support the channel, please consider donating at patreon.com slash Phoenix. Remember, by donating $1 or more, you can get access to the Team Frostbite Discord server, where personalities like myself, Fatman Falling, and Tom Horan of Six Lick Productions regularly interact with our supporters. Please stick around for the next installment, and I'll catch you all on the flip side.